My name is Gloria and I'm here to talk to you about neutrinos. This may sound a bit like sci-fi, but neutrinos are actually elementary particles. They are one of the types of building blocks of the universe. With the others, such as electrons, muons, taus, and the quarks, they form what we call matter. The counterpart of this so-called matter is what we call antimatter. We can think of them as two solutions to the same equation. Particles and their antiparticles share almost all characteristics like mass and spin, but have opposite charge. We can look at this as the opposite sign of the two solutions. When the particle and their counterparticle meet, they annihilate, releasing energy in the form of radiation. It is thought that both matter and antimatter were created equally in the first moments of the universe. However, as I said, today we're made of matter, so what happened to the antimatter? At some point in the birth of the universe, while matter and antimatter were annihilating, an imbalance occurred. All the antimatter was annihilated, but it left behind some matter. But I told you I was going to talk about neutrinos, so why am I going on about antimatter? Well, it turns out that neutrinos have some weird behaviors that can help explain this. So let's talk about neutrinos. Neutrinos are a special type of particle. Their mass is so small that for many years we just considered it zero. They also do not like to interact with other particles. They can go through many, many layers of lead completely unbothered. One of the most distinct characteristics about neutrinos is that they have different identities, whether they are interacting with other particles or flying freely. The interaction neutrinos are characterized by the other particle involved in their creation and annihilation. These are called the flavor states. While traveling though, there are three different kinds of neutrinos characterized by their masses. The relation between these states are not one to one, to the contrary. Each flavor state is a linear combination of the mass states. This weirdness allows neutrinos to change their flavor identity. So the neutrino that was produced as an electron neutrino can travel a certain distance and be detected as a muon neutrino. This means that A went to A prime, B to B prime, and C to C prime. We call this neutrino oscillation. But how are neutrinos going to help answer the matter-antimatter asymmetry problem? In the oscillation constants that I showed before, there is a phase parameter called delta Cp. We can just think of this as an angle. It appears in the argument of a sine function. If delta Cp is different from 0 pi or 2 pi, this is, if the sine is different from 0, muon neutrinos oscillate to electron neutrinos a little bit more than muon antineutrinos oscillate to electron antineutrinos, or a little bit less, depending if delta Cp is positive or negative. This may be a subtle effect, but it is a necessary condition for the explanation of the matter-antimatter asymmetry. So let's measure these parameters, no? The problem is, like I said, neutrinos do not like to interact. So we need really big detectors with in very intense beams to have a decent probability of interaction. The current beams and detectors have reached their full capacity and we still need more data. Hence a generation of new detectors. Like Dune. No, no, not that Dune. Dune is an anagram for the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. It's going to be a very big detector, actually two detectors. The near detector will be at Fermilab in Chicago and the far detector will be all the way in South Dakota at SURF. We need two detectors because we compare the flux of muon neutrinos produced close to the near detector and the flux of neutrinos that actually reach the far detector. June is being built as we speak, but for now preliminary tests are being done at Protodune at CERN. It will be the benchmark for the technology used at Dune and will provide the calibration. This calibration is very important to obtain the correct values of the parameters I have talked about before, so we can fully understand this oscillation process. One of the important parts of this calibration is the study of the space charge effect. This may sound complicated, but it's rather simple. Let's imagine a wandering muon goes through the detector and in its track, it produces lots of ionization. This is an electron is taken from the molecule, leaving a positive ion and an electron. Since the detector has an electric field applied, the electron will drift to the positive side and the ion will drift to the negative one. It's not so complicated, right? Well, the problem is that the speed of the ion is much slower than the speed of the electron. So there will be an accumulation of positive ions drifting slowly through the detector. This positive charge is responsible for distortions in the electric field. This is what we call space charge effect. It is very important to know this effect well as it has consequences on fundamental things like particle identification and track reconstruction. The main goal of my master thesis is to study how this affects the oscillation parameters, in particular the one responsible for charge parity violation. This is the delta Cp I talked about before. 
Under the supervision of Professor Fernand Barão and Professor José Maneira, I will study the impact of electric field distortion for the discovery of CP violation and contribute to the calibration of protodune and at a higher level, dune.